Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant. Welcome to Kentucky Newsmakers. We hope you're having a nice weekend. Our main guest this morning is the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Matt Bevan. The governor presented a state budget proposal this week that he says will put Kentucky's financial house in order. It includes cuts of $650 million, and he puts more than a billion dollars into the state's troubled retirement funds. Several areas are exempted from the cuts, including K-12 through education, state police and corrections. There would be an increase in money to test DNA evidence and for public defenders and money to continue a focus on the state's drug problem. Many other state agencies in higher education would face cuts. The governor reiterated he will close the state health exchange known as Connect. He said again that it is a myth that the state Medicaid expansion pays for itself. In his speech, the governor was direct. He thanked state workers for sending in him suggestions, the public as well. Governor Matt Bevan is now out talking about the spending plan that he is urging lawmakers to pass and good enough to come by and speak with us. Thank you, Governor, for coming. Appreciate Happy it. To be here. Some breaking news as uh, we uh, were taping this uh, on Friday for a weekend play. You indicated that an abortion clinic in Louisville uh, has been closed down by your administration. That is correct. Planned Parenthood, which is not authorized to perform abortions in Kentucky, Kentucky, is not licensed or authorized to do so, has been doing so, we found out yesterday, uh, for some weeks now. They decided to do this uh, on the stealth, uh, but then they came above board with the fact that they were doing it, thinking apparently they could do so with impunity. Uh, we shut that down. We gave them an immediate cease and desist. We said that we would seek an injunction if necessary. Uh, they have agreed to comply with the cease and desist. They have absolutely no legal recourse to stand on. They know it. We are going to uh, hit them with the full sanction of the law as it relates to fines, and we are in investigating right now the full extent of their disregard for the law. Did they indicate that they believed that they were licensed properly? They knew full well that they were not licensed. Uh, their argument is that they had applied for a license, and they figured that was good enough. But they know fully that that was not. They never got a response. Uh, they are not licensed. Uh, and they didn't even fill out the application process properly uh, when they applied during the previous administration. Did the uh, state government find this out through uh, media reports? No, they came out themselves. I think they thought that they... We live in a day and age, Bill, where, frankly, Planned Parenthood, uh, who has disregarded the law not only here in this instance in this state, but nationally on many fronts, and seems somehow to keep coming out smelling like a rose, I've made very clear we are not going to give one cent of the taxpayers' money to Planned Parenthood. It is not an organization that is advantageous to helping with women's health issues. We have hundreds of good women's health care providers in this state alone, and that's where our focus and our dollars are going to go. Well, let's talk about our tax dollars. Uh, you uh, just entered the governor's office about six weeks ago. You had to get a budget together in a hurry, as all governors do. Uh, you have called the money that you're putting into the pension plans the heart and soul of your budget unfunded liabilities north of thirty billion dollars uh, yes. for those uh, retirement funds is that what drove the budget making process it did and frankly that thirty billion is somewhat conservative uh... truth be told i think it's in it, it, it higher than that if we were to consider the true uh... liabilities that we have but the bottom line is until we plug those holes we will not be able to pay for all the other things that we want to have done there are things that we need to get done uh, in this state that people would like to get done that we are not able to do while we have this liability hanging over our heads. And the credit rating agencies that are out there looking at this state and the credit worth worthiness of this state are looking to see if we address this crisis. Well, there are those who have uh, wanted to bond this issue, uh, you know, borrow. You have said in your speech, we can't borrow our way out of this problem. Uh, the leaders in the House have proposed bonding, at least for the short term. You have said no way to that. Absolutely no way. It makes no sense. And think about this real quickly, and it's important for your viewers out there to understand this. If you had done this a year ago when it was first proposed, we would have borrowed paying interest rate of 4% to borrow $3.3 .3 billion. So 4% on $3.3 .3 billion is $125 million or so that we would have paid in interest for last year. We would have invested it in the stock market. Let's say we invested it in the S&P 500. That was down 1%. So now we're 5% in the hole. Oh, and we have a guaranteed rate of return that we've promised to the recipients in the KTRS, KERS plan of 4%. So there's a 9% differential. 9% of 3.3 billion 
is $300 million. We would have not only not fixed the problem, we would be $300 million further in debt in one year had we done what Greg Stumbo and the Democrats were calling us to do a year ago. Had we done it then, what, look what's happened to the markets this year. We'd be another half a billion dollars unfunded this year alone. It would be close to one billion dollars that we would be deeper in the hole had we done this when they first asked for it. Now they're coming back asking for it again, saying it's a good idea. It's a terrible idea. Governor, to get the money for the pensions, uh, you had to uh, make significant uh, cuts uh, across the board to uh, many parts of state government. You spared some areas, uh, but those cuts do include many programs and the universities in Kentucky. Uh, the cuts are four and a half percent now, immediately, right, for this uh, for this fiscal, this fiscal year. year, and then 9% for both years of the budget. Uh, why did you arrive at your numbers? I, again, I would have loved, frankly, to have gone with higher numbers. I'd be honest, it would have helped us to solve this problem more quickly. But we have to temper that with what is actually doable. These numbers are numbers that could work. We looked at this closely, studied it closely. We spent hundreds of hours working on this. And this is a number that can work. People can find nine cents out of the dollar. Everybody can live off of nine, 91 cents out of the dollar that they lived on uh, last year. Is that going to be desirable or easy? Not necessarily. Will it come at the expense of things that we wish we could spend money on? Of course it will. But we have to do it, and we will do it, and this will help us to shore our foundation up. Talk about some of the areas that you did exempt, uh, K-12, through state police. Yes, the SEEK formula, all that K-12 through funding, the state police, our social workers, uh, you know, our frontline people who touch, uh, you know, corrections officers, for example, uh, the, the health care uh, insurance pool for our workers, uh, pretty much anything that touches our employees directly uh, and our community directly has been exempted. The vast majority of the dollar was exempted. But there are many programs within the cabinets from which there will need to be nine cents of the dollar taken. Colleges and universities have seen a lot of cuts in recent years since the recession began. Uh, what signals are you giving to higher ed about the expectations of them going forward? You've, you talk about uh, outcome-based funding. Yes, outcome-based funding is coming to Kentucky. It will happen during our first uh, term here. This four years that we've been given by the people uh, will result in there being a allocation of all of these dollars using outcomes-based funding. The outcomes themselves will work with the university presidents. I met with them all earlier this week uh, after the budget. Uh, we had a call to talk about this. We'll work with them over the next 18 months to come up with the exact criteria. Starting at 18 months from now, fiscal years 18, 19, and 20, we will start to disseminate this billion dollars using outcomes-based funding. The outcomes are going to be determined by what does the marketplace want? What do employers want? What do the parents and the students themselves want when they graduate? They want to be employable. They want to not graduate with lots of debt and useless degrees. And that's what we are going to use the taxpayers' money to incentivize. Additionally, we have money available for workforce development, $100 million available for our universities to compete for. And I want to ask you about that. So that will be uh, among the universities. I, and, and yes, universities, ideally what I would like to see it be is our universities and technical schools being able to work together with business to say to their local business communities, and whether it's in Jefferson County or Fayette County or you know, Warren County or Boone County or some other county, those are kind of the big hubs where people might be. But the bottom line is wherever it happens to be, work together with the business community, say what is it that they want, what jobs do they want to see filled, let's develop programs, build buildings, do training programs, whatever the case might be, to ensure that we're delivering that. Within a couple of years, I want people graduating out of programs funded with this hundred million dollars. Governor, do you believe that as uh, when it comes to tax dollars being spent for public higher education, that those programs be in areas where there are jobs available? Absolutely. You know, we tell students you can be anything you want to be, but as you you have made reference to, uh, some may be in majors uh, where there are no jobs. I have incurred the wrath of the French literature community uh, of Kentucky uh, by, by using that as an example. And I don't mean to be pejorative about it. There are many great people who've studied it, but absolutely, we are not going to use federal dollars or state dollars that we have control of to the degree that we do have control over to subsidize the education for degrees that are not demanded by the marketplace. There will be some, you know, Pell Grants, for example, are beyond our control. Those are federal. 
But as it relates to state dollars, Kentucky dollars, that are being used to subsidize education, we're going to focus it on those degrees that the marketplace is demanding. Do you urge those universities to look for other uh, funding sources? Uh, you know, again, they have many. I mean, we're talking, the University of Kentucky is a multi-billion dollar uh, organization. I mean, they have an incredible uh, budget and an incredible, uh, you know, health care system and sports system and education system and you name it. It's a massive organization. And we're talking about some millions of dollars out of billions of dollars. And, and truth be told, it's a small piece of their overall budget. That workforce development money comes from lottery proceeds, is that right? No, the workforce no. development, no, the, the lottery proceeds are dollars that are going to be used for the Keys scholarships gotcha. and CAP and funding for our National Guardsmen and other you know, financial aid-based programs. Um, so they're, the intention of the lottery dollars are to be used for financial aid for education for our young people. We've been sweeping it for years. That's going to end. For the next four years, we're not sweeping that money. This will also help our universities because there will be more financial aid to be able to be given to students because we won't be sweeping it. Governor of the Commonwealth, Matt Bevan, is our guest on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We'll shift gears, talk about some other issues. We're coming back in just a moment. Welcome back into WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers as we visit with the Commonwealth of Kentucky's Governor, Matt Bevan. And uh, you're used to the title by now, right? Everybody calling you Governor. And sure, although <laughs> I, I respond to all number of names and, and titles, so that, uh, that's one of them. Well, during the speech the other night, a lot of people were asking afterward, and it was, you know, on Twitter, what's wrong with the Governor's hand? So what, what is the, what, the This deal? is a cast uh, <laughs> that I broke the trapezium. Uh -huh. which is our vocabulary word okay. for the day, trapezium, uh, which is a small bone in the palm of the hand here between the thumb and the rest of the hand. I broke it on Thanksgiving night. Uh, I was playing freeze tag in the dark with my children. I went down on a road that had some gravel on it, uh, broke that bone. It didn't have time for a month to get it looked at. Uh, when I did, finally, I was told it was broken, and so it's in a cast and probably will be for another two or three weeks. Are you finding you have... Uh family time? Are you making sure that... I'm uh, making you, sure I do. Yeah, it's yeah. important. I yeah. mean, yes. And, and you talked about one of the interesting things in the budget address the other night was uh, talking about the ideas and the information that you had gotten from state employees yeah. and from the public about the, the lives they're living, some of yes. the hardships some of them have uh, yes. in, in crafting time, uh, some of them uh, working long overtime hours, that sort of thing. Was that truly useful information to you? T tremendously so. Literally 10% of the thousands of emails we got were in regard to that specific issue. People just begging for some relief, saying, I love my job, I want to do my job, I need my job, but it's killing me and it's destroying our family and we need to have a life. And you bet I heard that loud and clear, loud and clear. You made, uh, uh, spoke of working together, made reference to the state motto uh, and said that people will get tired of hearing you say that. And yet when you take a position, you take a position mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and stick to your guns very often. Uh, what should people know in dealing with you over the next four years as far as your decision making process? A couple of things. Number one, if I tell you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I mean, I was raised that my word is my bond. My Christian faith is the cornerstone of my decision-making process, and I believe that your yes should be yes and your no should be no, and that's just my value system. Also, people should know that I'm a person who gathers information. I will listen to everybody and anybody, and I will take their opinions, and I will consider it. I will debate with them. I will have my opinion changed when it should be changed, and I will not have it changed when it shouldn't be, but I will ultimately gather information, and then what is, in my estimation, the best decision to be made is what I'll do. I'll make command-level decisions, as we used to call them when I was in the military. And you indicate you have made your decision about uh, Connect. You're going to shut it down. I have, yes. And, uh, and you have said that you do not believe uh, the estimates of it costing $23 million close. To, to close down. That's correct. It, there, this number was given to us by the very same people uh, who've given us a lot of bad information. So I won't even name them at this point. They know who they are. Uh, it's a bad number. It's a made-up number. It's been repeated as gospel. It's not correct. It will cost a few million dollars to do this right, and we will do it right. We will transition people. Just got a letter back actually yesterday from CMS, uh, which oversees this particular issue. Uh, and so we are in the process of working with the federal government to have a smooth and easy transition during open enrollment in November of this year 
for people to transition to the federal exchange. You said in your speech that uh, you did not believe those studies that uh, were uh, given to uh, former Governor Steve Beshear that the Medicaid expansion would pay for itself. Uh, you said, therefore, you're going to craft some kind of program for Kentucky if you can get the permission from the federal government to do that. What do you envision that looking like? A couple of things. First of all, not only did I say I didn't believe it before we knew that it wasn't true, I didn't. I read the entire study. I read their, their supposed proof of why it paid for itself. First of all, it only arguably did if you consider federal money to be free money. But even in that instance, it needed such subsidies that it could not sustain itself. And indeed, it's collapsing. We saw that with the Kentucky Health Co-op already failing. Most of the people who had qualified health plans, non-Medicaid health plans, were dumped last year off that plan when the system collapsed. So it's a big facade. It was never working properly. We were told that it was. Do you the solution for Medicaid, to your point, though, is we are going to have to work with CMS at the federal level to come up with a program that is affordable to us. We, we have almost 30 percent of Kentuckians on Medicaid, so it's important that we come up with something we can afford to pay for. It's going to look like people participating, having some work expectation of them where that is possible, some ability to make co-pays where that is possible, the ability to include compensation being paid by them for their own premiums, things of that sort. These are the types of things really checking the qualification of people, their assets and their income to ensure they're truly qualified. These are the things that are going to be have to be a part of an expanded Medicaid program that would work. And uh, obviously evolving as the months go along here. The snowstorm of uh, last week led to a statewide emergency. Uh, great teamwork demonstrated by Incredible. many. Uh, we had a, a story of two state troopers relaying chemotherapy drugs from yes. uh, Louisville over to Lexington and that kind of thing. And yet there were some issues out there. I-75 in Rockcastle yeah. County was a big problem, Governor, and uh, you, you're trying to figure out how that might have uh, turned out better. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one area. The first 13 miles into our state on I-65 as well were all, was even worse, believe it or not. 75 was closer to here and to your listeners, and so they were more aware of it. But I-65 was terrible as well. The biggest issue was ICE and these large vehicles, what are called CMVs, commercial motor vehicles, these tractor-trailer trucks could not get up some of the grades, and they would start to jackknife. When they jackknife, they'd go off the road, they'd block traffic, and cars were being trapped in between wrecks of trucks and so then you have hundreds and thousands of tr cars that were getting backed up now we never had anyone in dire uh, emergency there were a couple of instances where somebody needed a dialysis treatment somebody who had a liver transplant we were able to get an emergency vehicle into them and get that person safely there but we are doing an after-action review with our emergency management folks with our state police with our National Guard to figure out what we could do even better but I will say this Kentucky handled this as well as any state in America, and I'm so proud of our workers, every one of them who did such a good job out there. Uh, as uh, you go forward in the next several months, uh, of course, uh, this March 8th uh, special election is coming up, uh, and that is four seats in the House that could make it a tie in the State House if your Republican Party picks up those seats. You'll be involved in that? I sure will. I intend very much for us to win all four of those seats. I need to win all four of those seats. And it's going to be good for Kentucky to have conservative leadership in control at every level. Governor Matt Bevan, thank you for coming. Appreciate it very much. And we're back in just a moment on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We're joined now by Bill Owen, who is president and CEO at Lexington Center. It runs Rupp Arena, the Convention Center, and the Opera House. Governor Bevan, who was just with us, has allocated $60 million in his proposed budget for an improvement project at Lexington Center. Next week, Saturday, February 6th at noon, Super Bowl Saturday, we'll be airing a documentary on WKYT about how Rupp Arena was built in the first place. It takes you through the political, business, and real estate moves that it all took to pull it off in the 1970s. It's called Game Changer. Again, it is next Saturday at noon, and I have seen it, and it is very interesting. And Bill Owen is here, and it's good to see you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. What will people see when they uh, watch Game Changer? Well, I, it, 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 how the video came to be uh, is a little bit of an interesting story. A couple of years ago, the Lexington Center Board wanted to recognize uh, the remaining board members, original board members, there were four living at, at, at that time, still are, uh, and some of the people that uh, put the whole project together back in the late 1960s and early 70s. 
and a committee was appointed to figure out how to recognize them. We had plaques on the wall. We had resolutions and minute books. So what we hit on was doing a video oral history. Uh, long story short, 16 people that were involved with the project 40 years ago were interviewed and over 16 hours of videotape collected, which Arthur Rouse did a terrific job editing down to about a 56 minute documentary. Uh, that explains and it and it gives you the whole history of the relationship with the University of Kentucky, how RUP was conceived, how the convention center uh, and the shops were added to the project. Uh, talks about uh, rescuing the Opera House, uh, which uh, was doomed for demolition in the 1970s. So it's a really fascinating story. If anyone who who lived in Lexington through that period has an interest in University of Kentucky basketball. Uh, or an interest in downtown and Lexington's history is going to want to see it. I came away from it amazed that Rupp Arena ever happened uh, because you have so many elements going on. There were so many uh, real estate issues to work through. There were business issues to work through. UK President Otis Singletary apparently was hard to win over to the project, right? Uh, absolutely, and that's, that's part of the fascinating story. A, a group of people that, that named themselves the Alley Cats yeah. because they were in a back alley of Memorial Coliseum trying to get tickets and access uh, and to go from 11,500 seats to 23,000. Uh, that really opened the door for, uh, and, and then, you know, the television and broadcast. You had to, you had to, to stay up till 11.30 and, and watch replays on WKYT uh, to see them on television. It said during the course of the program that had today's open meeting laws been in place, uh, it's very questionable whether this could have been pulled off. Well, I won't comment on that. that you know, that, the, the, the original founders, and I'll trust that those men and women that put the project together, uh, have a recollection and a perspective on that. Uh, it, it, but no question, it took a, a fusion of political and business interests to, to, to make it happen. And do you think they could have conceived of what Rupp Arena would be these no. years later? No, and the other part of the story, it, was, it, it, it came to be right about the time Fayette County and Lexington City were merging into the merged urban county government. So you had personalities, and you had a county judge, you had a mayor and Foster Pettit that uh, uh, had to, to put some issues aside to bring it to be. And if you think about uh, over the last 40 years what downtown would be without the Lexington Center Complex, uh, it certainly would be a much different uh, type of, of, uh, of place. This was right after the rail lines had been uh, pulled up from downtown. It really was, was a downtown in need of renovation. Yes, and, and uh, you know, the, the federal government with the urban renewal program and uh, just uh, so, many, so many planets had to align financial, political, relationship and so many things and it's it's well worth the hour watching it. One thing you'll learn during it is that there was at one time a proposal to put the jail where Triangle Park is. That's <laughs> uh, that's the, one of the fascinating <laughs> elements that came out of that 16 hours of, of uh, of interviews. When you fast forward to today, the home of the Wildcats, uh, uh, you're getting a lot of accolades as well for some of the diverse shows that are coming back to Rupp Arena. I mean, think of all of the, the stars who played there during the, uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s, and now there is a feeling that that, uh, that is coming back. Well, James Taylor and, and uh, Pearl Jam uh, uh, on sale today, and uh, uh, some of those uh, classic uh, uh, artists and uh, entertainers that, that go back to, to, to people my age. And uh, so we're, we're delighted with the, uh, with the programming that we're able to bring, both at Rupp and, and the Lexington Opera House. It was key to being able to put that floor down and take it out, right, for different types to of To be shows? able, yes, a portable yeah. basketball floor is, is, uh, is key. Uh, Rupp Arena hosts, on balance, about 850,000 visitors a year uh, for everything from concerts, basketball, the WKYT Sport Boat and Recreation Show that's uh, coming up week after next. Yeah, and, February and just, 11th to 14th. Right, yep. you can zip line through Rupp Arena. Uh, so there's, uh, <laughs> it, it really is an interesting uh, and diverse 
uh, activities. Bill, what's ahead for up? Uh, we have uh, heard from the governor uh, here uh, just a bit ago. There have been some ambitious proposals. Uh, there have been some that are a bit more scaled down, but Governor Bevin has uh, earmarked in his budget proposal $60 million to assist with the uh, Lexington Center improvements. Well, and we're excited about uh, about moving forward on that. We've been working. That those are our, our convention center uh, issues and uh, uh, Heritage Hall has been undersized for 30 years and because it's it's hemmed in by Rupp, Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, Main Street and Vine Street you cannot enlarge it, it has to be replaced. Uh, but after 40 years it served the community very well so this is about uh, uh, finding a way to fund and support the economic impact that conventions and meetings at Lexington Center bring. We're already in the midst of, a, of a, a significant video, audio, and technology upgrade in Rupp Arena itself. Uh, that's a $15 million project that uh, includes uh, extending our, our rigging grid to accommodate these major shows that come in, um, includes a, a center-hung video uh, scoreboard array, uh, Wi-Fi throughout the complex and some other improvements and, and that's ongoing. All right, well we'll see where it goes from here. If folks want to catch how it all came to be, again it is Game Changer and it will be airing on WKYT next Saturday, February 6th at noon, Super Bowl Saturday and it's interesting. Thanks for coming. Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we thank you for joining us for this edition of WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Have a good week ahead.